Hi, everyone. Can you hear me all right? Yeah? Right. So thank you for that introduction, and thank you all for being here. It's really cool to see you all here, and actually, this is a great theme to, to be talking about, because we're kind of drawing to the close of a, of a crazy year, I'm sure, for everyone, and we are about to start a new one. So it's always a time also for reflection and thinking back of, of our time and what we can maybe do different going forward. But just to sort of a little bit of context around my background. So <clears throat> I joined LEGO 18 years ago, which to most people when I say that, they look at me in horror and think, God, you're like one of those people who are like have a job for life, do you? And, and yes, I've been at LEGO for a long time, but also, as mentioned, in many different roles. And, and you might also be aware that LEGO has gone through a, a sort, of, sort of turnaround, if you like, and transformation. So when I joined, in the product design area, we were literally in a crisis mode and, and fighting for our survival as a company 18 years ago. We then had a fantastically successful turnaround and grew the company enormously. So the company now today is six times bigger than it was when I joined. So we were 3,000 people then, we are 18,000 people now. So in that time, we've continued to do well, which thankfully for all of us, but, but at the same time, I think given the different areas that I've worked in, I've also had the benefit of observing a kind of, almost like an anthropologist in a company. You know, this journey and where all of us, companies, people, we, we tend to get stuck and, and how some of those things get magnified, literally, as we join and form organizations that grow in size. And what I sort of wanted to zoom in on, so there's a lot of talk about what did LEGO do to be successful, and, and of course, what we always have to remember is that what maybe worked then may not work now, because times are different. But one of, some of the things that are, I keep coming back to are actually you know, the beliefs that underpin some of the decisions we make. Those beliefs we often don't think enough about, because beliefs, behavior, and habits those three things, they form you know, mindsets which are so incredibly powerful simply because we spend so little time thinking about them. We don't observe them in ourselves very much. We don't challenge them in each other. We just walk around on autopilot and we find that sometimes things don't go quite how we imagined. And we are quite surprised about that. <laughs> but we, def we definitely don't stop enough to think about why that is and actually challenge ourselves. Many of you might have come across uh, Stanford professor Carol Dweck, who has done research on mindsets. And she's identified two mindsets that really have an enormous impact on our lives, far bigger than we often realize. The fixed mindset, which is this belief that basically we are born with an innate set of skills and talents, intelligence, and our mission in life is to figure out what we're good at and then stick to that. Or the growth mindset, which is the belief that any capability, skill, intelligence, it's like a muscle that you can develop by essentially exposing yourself to new challenges and trying new things. And again, these two mindsets look at failure in very different ways. You know, a fixed mindset sees failure as a proof that there is a lack of ability. And a growth mindset just goes, well, okay, um, I'll just try something else, or try a bit different, or work a bit harder, but essentially much more expansive view of options and opportunities. What's scary is that Dweck has managed to prove that children as young as five can actually, uh, you know, they already experience these mindsets. And she tested it by giving kids a bunch of puzzles, some very difficult ones, that it took a while for the kids to learn to solve. And then there was an option. So once the kids had mastered them, she gave them an option to say, OK, do you want to keep doing the ones you already know how to do, or do you want to try a new one? And even in this tiny group of, you know, this group of very young kids, you could divide the group into two. Those who were happy to keep doing what they knew well, and those who got bored and wanted to try something harder. So again, it's something which, again, to be clear, all of us, we are a mixture of both. We will have growth mindsets about some things in our, ourselves, and we will have fixed mindsets about other things. So we are not a one person or another. We are a mixture. But the interesting thing is, if we are not paying attention to this in ourselves, we are actually blind to opportunities we are maybe passing by because we are not really looking at those opportunities with open eyes and we are just making assumptions when actually we could be taking a much more 
sort of first principles approach, going back to the bottom of things, saying what do we know for sure is true, and then reasoning off from there, rather than just continuing on the autopilot piece. This is, of course, interesting, because when you take that on an individual level, and then you ask yourself, well, what happens if you put a ton of people together and you stick them in an organization? I would argue organizations, too, develop mindsets about stuff. Things they're quite happy to try and things they're, they're terrified about getting wrong. And I would say Lego is one of those as well. So I've observed that in different contexts. And, um, and of course, we thought we were doing extremely well until we hit our crisis. So I guess for this talk, I also sort of asked myself, well, what does it take to build growth mindsets in an organization? How do you do it? And how do you sort of, what are the things you need to put in place to get there? And of course, what can you learn from that for yourself as well? And I guess the, the, the first point is really to sort of think about um, an outside in noble purpose. So give you an example. As any company grows, there's a very big sort of center of gravity, which is about turning inward and spending a lot of time organizing yourself so that you can do all the work that you're meant to be doing. That sort of uh, entropy, if you like, that sort of thing that just sucks your energy, it, it can be a very sort of tempting to then also set your purpose, why are you here as a company, as a kind of mission to, oh, we just want to be big, or we want to hit our numbers, or we want to make this much profit. Very easy to be inward looking in goals as well. And even us, Lego, when we were in our crisis mode, our m mission at the time was to be the biggest brand for families with children. And you might think, well, that's not so unusual. I mean, you pretty much are the biggest brand for families with children. What's wrong about that? What's wrong about it is the fact that such a vision or mission, because it's inward looking, it doesn't add any value to who your consumers are. People who buy Lego don't care how freaking big we are. They just want a cool toy. So <laughs> if we give ourselves or set ourselves a mission like this, which is basically all about us, we are missing a big opportunity about what truly we are in the world for. What would the world miss if we weren't here? So we had to get all the way to a crisis to sort of stare at this cliff and, and look down and go, it's pretty far down there, we better think of something else to do. So we had to really almost discover this by going, you know, cap in hand and asking people, you know, children, parents, customers, fans, employees, child psychologists, asking all of them to say, well, why, why, what would the world miss if Lego wasn't here? What, what, would, what would you miss the most? And what people talk to us about, <laughs> but certainly not about the biggest brand among families with children, I tell you that. They didn't even care about the video games or the, the clothes or the watches or the theme parks and all the crazy things we were doing at the time. What everyone kept coming back to was, was this impact on creativity that playing with Lego has. You know, this thing that you start building and ideas just come and somehow you can put your ideas into you know, a model, you show it to someone else and then guess what, you get even more ideas. So you develop a kind of confidence in your own ability and you continue to develop your creative skills. So that thing, you know, we gave us that kind of precious insight which we then developed into our vision statement of inspire and develop the builders of tomorrow. That, that is the reason we're here. It's a great realization because it's a job that is never done. So tip to all of you, if you're looking for a purpose, pick one which is never done because it'll keep you focused on the outside world. It'll keep you asking what is it that you can do for others to really make a difference. And even as a person, to be really great and bold at what you do, you probably will get there not by asking how amazingly rich and wealthy you can be, but coming up with something that will really make a difference for others. And on that subject, the other thing that we often run into, back to the beliefs part, is what people believe about leadership. Now, leadership is things, uh, something which, again, we tend to talk about this idea of leaders and followers. And everyone's almost accepted that as the sort of gospel of, oh, all these management consultants, there are the leaders, and then there are followers, and then there are orders, and stuff gets done. 
But of course, it's again, if you think about how the world is these days, it's a completely useless belief because what it does is that it creates a way of thinking which means that we assume that some people have the orders or the direction and other people sort of are passive and they sit and wait. And then we create an organization which is far too slow to react. Decisions and thinking gets done far removed from the problem because we sit and think, well, maybe the leaders will tell us what to do now we have this problem, rather than the people who are actually sitting with it, who know probably far more about it, having a voice and speaking up. And in the end, of course, it encourages people to do what worked well before, back to the fixed mindset, because again, why should you pipe up and ask and push for something different since obviously the leader knows best, right? But all of these things, again, they cement organizations and sort of ossify or kind of calcify them into a way of working, which really isn't very helpful. And it's sort of, I guess, you could distill it down to this single line, which is this belief that leadership is a role, it's not an act. And of course, if you think about it, it's actually, leadership is not something that you do and only do once you have a title. Anyone can do it. But we were also, as having grown as a company, you know, we also found that having become really big and become very siloed, like all companies, you know, all these processes had taken over and we were super efficient, but we weren't really set up in a way which was about encouraging people to be empowered, solve problems where they were, and really take responsibility and lead where they were to, to move the company forward. So we realized, okay, what normally companies do in this situation is they call a consultant, say, help, <laughs> and then there will be a retreat with the executive team and the management consultants, and there will be a new leadership model designed and rolled out by the CEO. Again, that doesn't work. I mean, if we're saying that this is a dynamic world where we want people to take ownership for stuff, it doesn't help if you're then cementing things again in this old way of somebody having the answer and everyone else needs to sit and listen, right? So we asked a diverse group of people from all over the company, all different levels, tenure, roles, locations. I mean, I was a super, super diverse group of people. And we asked them a simple question. What to you is leadership at Lego? And they came back with this idea of the leadership playground. Okay, you all look puzzled. Good, because they, we'd look, look puzzled too. We're like, what? What's the leadership playground? And they said this very simple thing is that, of course, leadership starts with building trust. It starts with creating a safe space, just like a playground is a safe space for kids. Kids go into a playground, they test themselves, they really play together, do stuff, go on adventures together, and they do it because they feel safe there. So it actually is about having shared rules and ways of doing stuff and means that everyone can really, you know, sort of test their limits in a safe environment. So leadership really is actually starts with creating a safe space. But then you think, well, what is great leadership? And it again, it's actually super simple. We all are experts at telling what is great leadership. Why? It's because when we are in presence of great leadership, we feel energized. You know, we all, we've all been there when you've had the opposite, right? Where you sit and you go like, oh, God, I can't believe this thing, you know? So the complete opposite, right? So we then simplified this whole piece around leadership and defined it as, really, leadership at LEGO is to create the space to energize everybody every day. Now, that is a super simple line, but it's interesting because it's a line which is totally disconnected to whether you're the CEO or the person on the telephone or whatever, all of us can make that our goal and aspire to it because it's actually about us working with our own capacity to create a safe space for, for you to say what's on your mind and for us to have a conversation where you walk away from it, you feel energized rather than like, God, I never want to talk to Cecilia again. Jesus Christ, I mean, somebody could just give me somebody else. Anyway, you know. So, and of course, we all learn because, of course, we all learn when we, we have that interaction and we say, oh, that went well, or that didn't go so well, so now we try something different. Last thing 
in creating organizations that are more growth mindset minded, stronger at leadership. The last thing that stands in the way is all of our fear of failure. Again, very normal human impulse. We, we try to avoid that stuff like the plague. So it's even when it's New Year's resolution time, we tend to go for extremely audacious goals and then we get paralyzed by the sheer size of the thing we've t decided to do. And then by February, we've forgotten what it was and then we hope nobody reminds us by March that we weren't gonna do it. So that's kind of a funny human condition that we have. So instead of thinking about sort of paralyzing ourselves, it's really about learning to build our experimentation muscle. This act of trying something, observing how it goes, capturing the learning, taking that and then doing it again. So rather than thinking, oh, it's got to be these big, bold moves, it's actually about small things. Because actually what we want to learn is this ability to come up with ideas, try it, observe what happens, capture what we can learn from it, and go again. And of course, small experiments build our confidence. And when things go well, we feel good, we try something more, right? If it doesn't go so well, again, it's a small risk, it's not such a big, big deal, so we can then again move on. But as organization, as people, I think that is a key piece that, that we have to learn. And also in our uh, transformation as a company has been a big element of the leadership playground is to encourage people to experiment. And we did it actually by introducing this idea of missions. So missions really are like playing cards where you, we're sort of encouraging teams to experiment with everything from how they organize their working day to a meeting to a particular project or even how they lunch together. Could be tiny things, but it's just about getting that muscle working. And through that, to kind of wrap it all up, it's, it's really the, the question is, so how do you roll something like this out in the organization? Because yes, you don't want the CEO to do the town hall and then the webinar and the whatever rollout plan and six months later people forgot what the project was about and <laughs> that kind of thing. So we decided we also had to really eat our own medicine and think about how do we really get the organization to own this? So we, we trained a person in every single team in the company. We call them a, play, a playground builder because they are a kind of coach or a facilitator whose job is really to help the whole team move forward on this uh, journey of creating the safe space to energize everyone and also trying the missions. And that person is not the boss of the team. This is, a, this is actually an interesting exercise because all the bosses were like, yeah, but I want to know what the team is going to be doing all the time. And they're like, yeah, but we're not going to tell you. <laughs> You're going to have to join in with everyone else because nobody's a boss of a playground, are they? Are they? Uh, only the bully is maybe temporarily the boss, but then nobody likes them, do they? So the bosses were like, okay, fine. So you have to learn to also let go and, and kind of let go of the desire for control and to really get everybody feeling that they have a stake in this. And that starts with actually, again, everyone taking responsibility for the playground. So that's kind of a whistle stop sort of <laughs> collection of thoughts where I'm gonna end and is to say like, when you think about change or innovation or yourself or even to be bold and brilliant, pay attention to your behavior, your habits, you know, your your thinking, your mindsets. They are, sometimes they help you and sometimes they really are tripping you up and you don't deserve that. So the way to get on top of it is start observing it and start challenging it. That's a very handy way to move forward then to also thinking, spotting yourself, thinking about leadership and how you see your role in different situations and maybe where you are also sitting back sometimes and maybe sometimes that moment is actually not to sit back, but just to pipe up and think, well, what could I do in this moment that would energize those around me? How can I make them more excited about this and doing this together? And that will actually propel you forward also on this journey of thinking about experiments and how you can also battle your own fear of failure and try stuff. Because again, you know, nobody has it figured out in case you wondered, least of all me. So <laughs> it's like, Really, the price is trying it, learning from it, and trying again. And through that, energizing everyone around you. Thank you.